Uh, we all know actually why we're here. That's to look at uh, what happened, particularly in run 14, a uh, sodium reactor experiment. Uh, I'll just real quickly on my personal background, uh, I wanted to get you a feeling as to how I got pulled into this. And uh, most of my career, almost all of my career, has been involved with the development of methods to analyze severe accidents, uh, to look at the release of radionuclides in those accidents, and then also to, to assess the risk to the public from those accidents. Um, at the time of the Three Mile Island accident, the group that I was involved with was about the only organization, or was really the only organization, that had methods to, to analyze severe accident behavior in light water reactors. So we helped uh, the NRC, we're an NRC contractor at that time, and then we also helped them in the review of the accident uh, following that. Um, in 1999, uh, the work that I did early in my career was a re research organization called Battelle Memorial Institute. Uh, in 1999, I became a professor at Ohio State University, which is just down the road from Battelle. And there I, I teach and I also do research. Over the last couple of years, we've been working on a project with the Department of Energy to look at realistic assessments of radionuclide release in severe accidents in sodium-cooled fast reactors. And although there are some significant differences with that versus the SRE, the fuel behavior is very similar. Uh, so a couple of months ago when I got the call from Sandia and they said, uh, would you like to participate in review, I went back and I had the book, actually the Thompson book that, uh, that Tom made the quote out of that had the, the review of the SRE accident in it. And from looking at that, I knew it was going to be interesting, and so I was curious, and I said, and I also recognized it might help me in my project that I was doing with the Department of Energy. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll participate in the review. Of course, at that time, I didn't know a lot that I know now about uh, what's, what kind of the background for all this was. I didn't know that there were the estimates for very large releases of iodine and cesium by Luckbaum and Dr. Vieira, um, and I also didn't know about the concerns that had been raised locally about public health concerns and this type of thing. So, so I didn't really know exactly what I was walking into when I agreed to do this. Um, okay, so uh, now from my technical review, and you'll see why as, as we get into it further, um, I really don't think that the, the conclusions that Lockbaum and they drew about the possibilities of as much as 30% of the iodine and cesium being released in this accident are, are real. And I'll describe the, those reasons in a little bit here. And basically what I want to try to do is to try to, to explain in, in lay terms um, what the reasons are that we think that, that the, the iodine and cesium really didn't get out and, and what did get out. Okay, now Paul already mentioned the barriers t to the release of radionuclides. We really have to understand that to get a feeling as to what had to happen to give us a release. And, uh, and Paul mentioned his first barrier was actually the fuel itself. And it is true that the fuel really is a barrier to the release of all of these radionuclides. This particular kind of fuel, if you, if you irradiate it for a substantial period of time, you actually will get some porosity, some, some vac vacant holes building up in that fuel, and you'll get some migration out of the fuel during normal operation, and we've seen that in experiments with uh, very similar fuel types in the EBR2 uh, reactor. But in this particular accident, and with this particular reactor, because of the very low amount of irradiation exposure that this fuel had been to, uh, you really don't expect to see very much release. There are some mechanisms by which directly some fission products can wind up outside of the fuel. So you'll see a little bit of iodine and cesium in that, in that uh, uh, barrier area uh, between the, the uh, uh, penetration area in that upper shield uh, between the, the uh, cover gas area 
and that reactor building. And so that really wasn't perfect. And I think that once you started to get some serious fuel damage, then you got to see that it wasn't perfect and you start to see some material coming up through there into the reactor building, but never, never really a large amount quantitatively as far as the amount of uh, radioactive materials are concerned, but enough that they had to do some patching or they, they got some significant levels. Um, maybe I'll, I'll back off and say I'm not going to take advantage of Tom. And uh, let me take advantage of one thing at this point because we'll just bring it up later. And that is you actually can get some particulate material up into the reactor building as a result of noble gases that transport to that area as noble gases. Then they decay into things that actually do form particulate. And so you can get, so there's no question, there was some particulate material that deposited on surfaces in the reactor building and, and there were swipes that were done that, that, that measured that, as well as these constant area monitor, uh, these uh, cams, these constant monitors where there's filter paper and deposits on there. So there definitely is some particulate up there. But, but, but th that wasn't the major element of, of uh, Tom's arguments anyway, I don't think. He was just uh, an item of curiosity. But, but you really can get noble gases transporting up there, decaying into elements that actually form particulates that are also radioactive. Um, okay, and then the other thing is the reactor building itself. And, and norm, in, in commercial reactors today, we have containments that are robust. They can take a large internal load Partly they have to do that because in the light water reactors that we talked about before, you have the potential for this high pressure uh, water to depressurize and give you a big pressure load. So you really do have to have a, a, uh, a robust containment that's leak tight. Um, but what was used uh, for the sodium reactor experiment was a confinement concept in which what they do is they establish a negative pressure inside of the containment. So if you have a release to the containment, to this reactor building part, then you have in leakage. Now, in order to do that, you have to evacuate gases uh, out of the top. Now, a large fraction of the reactors that were built at the time of the sodium reactor experiment uh, were of this confinement type. They used confinement types rather than containments. I'm not a fan of confinement types. There are lots of people even today that are talking about <coughs> with future reactor designs using confinement systems rather than containment. There are other elements of the confinement consistent concept that we use at, at sodium reactor experiment that I'm not a big fan of either. But I do think that probably in this accident, that system worked adequately as far as the protection of the public. It, it did require some controlled releases of noble gases as a minimum. Okay. Now let's get to the heart of this, which is the release of radionuclides from overheated and molten fuel. Uh, again, uh, Paul talked about the, the noble gases, which react with almost nothing, uh, the xenons and the kryptons. And, um, and part of the reasons why we, the exposures aren't too big from xenons and kryptons is that if they're released, there, there's just an external shine on people that gives them a dose, whereas one of the reasons we worry about things like iodine and cesium is that you could breathe them in or you could ingest them if they fall on stuff. And, and you can get an internal dose uh, as a result of that. So typically, the kinds of exposures that you could get from them are potentially higher than, than the xenon and krypton. Uh, so a lot of concern now about the radioactive uh, iodine and this, this, this this formation of a liquid that gives the radionuclides the opportunity to really migrate out of the liquid and potentially get airborne. And there's no question that once that material became liquid, you'd get a significant release of the noble gases that are in there. Virtually all of the noble gases that are in that part of the uranium that's, that's mixed with the iron from the cladding uh, would be released. They get into the sodium, and they also will be released from the sodium to the cover gas. And then the questions are, did they really get pumped to, the, uh, to these holding tanks, or was there some period when they were being bypassed uh, to the stack? But, but again, 
the, part, the question isn't really so much the noble gases as it is the iodine and cesium and what happened to those. And, and um, in contrast to the noble gases, uh, based upon our analysis, and I'll explain this, and, and common uh, uh, understanding of the behavior of metal fuels today, there would be very little, very little iodine and cesium released. So, again, iodine has a, a low boiling point. When the fuel melts, uh, if, if the iodine were in the fuel as uh, elemental iodine, you would expect some of it to be released uh, uh, to the vapor, I'm sorry, you'd some of it's released from the uranium. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about a dilution effect, that is uh, another effect that hasn't actually been discussed today. I'll discuss it in terms of cesium, cesium because it's more important with regards to understanding cesium than it is with iodine. Because with iodine, the answer is just a matter of chemistry, and that is, is the iodine isn't there in the form of elemental iodine, it's in there in the form of iodides. There may be a little bit of cesium iodide in there, but in reality, when these fission products are born, they see a lot more uranium than they see cesium. So the first thing that they see that they want to attach up to is uranium, and so that's what they form is a uranium iodide. And we know that based upon the measurements, and again, I want to try to keep this at a lay discussion to the extent that I can, but but based upon just our understanding of chemistry and what it is that makes different chemicals react in different proportions, um, there's definitely a strong preference for iodine to be in the form of uranium iodide rather than as, as elemental iodine. So, so uranium iodide has, has a very high boiling point. We just do not expect uranium iodide to be released. So, so to me, there is no mystery as to why the I, only a small amount of the iodine got out of that port portion that was liquefied. Um, now, why is it that people have worried so much about iron? One of the reasons is that there was an accident that occurred in England at Windscale with uh, a, a, um, a reactor, it was actually a plutonium production reactor, but had uranium fuel in which there was a significant iodine release. And the question is, well, why was that iodine released at wind scale, and why do I say it wasn't released here? And the reason is that at wind scale, the, the graphite that was there was on fire, basically. There was air flowing through that facility. The uranium was oxidized by that air, and it changed the chemistry so that the iodine was released as I2. And we understand why it was that there was that release that occurred at wind scale. The other thing and that I think has led to some confusion, and I think it's the thing that really led Lockbaum to make these kind of upper estimates that he made, was that when we looked at the oxide fuels that are we use in commercial light water reactors, um, and we have developed predictive tools to determine how much would be released. If you look at the kind of accident that occurred at Three Mile Island, in which you have water boiling off and, and uncovering uranium dioxide, the melting of uranium dioxide. And actually, there's an effect here that's not un similar to what happens with the eutectic formation in these metal fuels, in which there's some zirconium that, that reduces the melting point of the mixture. So we start off uh, with a melting that is much higher than the kinds of temperatures we're talking about, but not all the way up at the, at the melting point of uranium dioxide, which is at about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but at a temperature that's much higher than experienced here. And, and when you look at the releases, the rates of release of these um, materials, they are very sensitive to temperature, so that even a small change in temperature can have a huge effect on the volatility the amount that gets released. So, but the other thing is the chemistry is just is entirely different. So basically, in when we look at the analysis of uranium oxide fuel melting in a light water reactor, we estimate that there would be nearly 100% release of iodine and cesium from that portion that's molten. And, and, and uh, 
Dave Lockbaum, very familiar with light water reactors, and, and that's really why he said, well, there's a third of the fuel that's damaged, potentially molten. That's why, as an upper estimate, I would say that there could be 30% of the iodine and cesium released. And, and he was wrong because his chemistry was wrong. Okay, now let's talk about cesium. And, and with regards to cesium, cesium doesn't really react with uranium, but we do understand what happens when you, you take a substance and you dissolve it in another substance, when you have a solvent and you have a small contaminant of that. And if you think of the uranium as it's melting as being the solvent, and you think of cesium as being a small contaminant, and you look at, if I had a block of cesium and, and I heated it up to its boiling point, you get a rapid release of, of, um, of uh, cesium uh, from that block. But if you take that cesium and you dilute it in a solvent, then the rate of release that you get is suppressed dramatically, and it's suppressed according to the fraction of the contaminant that you have to the solvent material. So because there are 10,000 times as many uranium atoms as cesium atoms within that fuel, you'd expect to see a much reduced release rate of cesium from that fuel relative to if you had had a block of cesium that was standing and you put it at the same temperature. Now there's another thing that also is important and that is that uranium is a terrific solvent. And what I talked about is basically what happens in what we call an ideal solution. But some things are good solvents and some things aren't. Uranium is a terrific solvent. And so the, the rate of release from uranium is a factor of 100 greater, I'm sorry, a factor of 100 less than if it was an ideal solution. So the other factor that says we're going to get a very small release rate of cesium from the uranium uh, is is this other factor that of uranium being a great solvent? So, so for those two reasons, we expect to see uh, a very small amount of cesium uh, get released in the form of elemental cesium from the fuel. But once it does get released, the story is not really over because it has to face the sodium. So basically, what then really happens with sodium? And we know how much iodine and cesium that really were in the, uh, in the sodium. And um, so uh, once the radionuclides get released from the fuel, then if they, the noble gas is they're just going to uh, bubble up through the sodium and be released. Uh, they have very little solubility in the sodium. Any iodine that's released to the sodium pool is going to react to form sodium iodide. And I'll talk about this question. Well, could some of the iodine have been in bubbles that went up with the with the uh, krypton and xenon? And the answer is yes, but it also depends upon the. And it's difficult not to get a little bit technical here in terms. It has to do with the pressure, the partial pressure of cesium and iodine that are in those bubbles, and and what happens as they move up through that pool is, is that they will diffuse uh, out, basically out of, of the bubble. And the question is, how much of it diffuses out by the time it makes that transit up there? And we have methods to analyze, the, to analyze that, and I haven't done the analysis in this particular case where you actually have flow going on that's decreasing the amount of time that you have before those bubbles get to the surface. And, and they release. But that is a mechanism by which if you had some iodine, as I've said before, we have no reason to believe there is there's any significant release of iodine from the uranium or cesium. But if you did, you can have some to transport up that way rather than being captured in the, in the sodium. Once they're in the sodium, though, then any iodine that's there reacts to form sodium iodide, and it's not going to be released and any cesium, you've got the same effect that I talked about before, where you've got this very low concentration of cesium within the sodium. And although sodium isn't as good of a solvent, you have a much 
much larger number of sodium atoms to cesium atoms than we really had in the fuel of uranium atoms to cesium atoms. So, so that very much suppresses any release that you have uh, of cesium from the pool. And, and basically what happened to the cesium then, there was a lot of oxygen in that, in that sodium. And I think it, it could have wound up on surfaces. That's what normally would be happening. It would react with surfaces. Uh, but, but it also it could have reacted with the carbonaceous materials in there or with the oxygen. I think primarily it reacted with the oxygen to form sodium oxide, cesium oxide, and that then it was caught in a cold trap, which is a little bypass region in this reactor where they cool it, things off and, and they can remove things that will freeze out. So, so basically, that's what happened to the cesium. Okay, and I am sorry I already ran through that slide. Okay. So, based upon a technical evaluation, and, and the reality is this is all chemistry, and, the, and it's not a question of whether there's a meaningful non-scientific answer or a meaningful scientific answer. Whatever the scientific answer is, it's the correct one. The question is, is do I have the chemistry right or don't I have the chemistry right and, and what are the things there? But, but uh, there's speculation of that there could be cesium and iodine released from the uranium, but there's really no technical basis that's been provided as to why you would expect that to be the case. So on technical grounds, I think there's really no reason to believe the conjecture that there would be iodine or cesium released in any significant amounts from this material that got molten. Now, but let's look at the converse and say, okay, there are these conjectures of the release of, of iodine and cesium. How much evidence is there physically at the plant, the measurements that were taken that says, I can definitively say that there wasn't a release and I can't do that. And for the reasons that Tom talked about, when you get into uh, looking at all, well, first of all, you know, if you have a controlled experiment, you can decide just what you're gonna measure and you can make definitive statements. Whenever you look at these accidents, and this accident isn't a lot different from most other accidents, the Three Mile Island accident, we were actually pretty lucky on the amount of material that was really available that was measured to, to interpret it. But if you look at the data here, the, the dilemmas that Tom talked about of looking at these various inconsistencies between things, the lack of data that you really would want, and what you really want are samples where people went in at the right time, they looked at what was airborne, and they, and they measured how much iodine and cesium was there, and that just never happened. Now, there's no data that says there was a release of iodine and cesium. There's no path of cesium downwind where it rained out and, and today we would be able to measure it and we don't see it there, but you can make an, an argument that says, well, it would, just because of the configuration of this environment here, it could have been farther down and we've just never looked at the right place to see, see the cesium. Today, if we went and looked for the iodine, we wouldn't see it anymore. And, and there was a grab sample that was actually measured in September and there were arguments, well, if there had been iodine, we would have seen it there. Well, you can argue all sorts of things about, well, when did the, the release really occur? And, and Paul talked about the period when he thinks the melting of material occurred based upon those dates, and it was pretty late there. And my own feeling is very much like Tom's, is that I think there had to be this melting had to occur really early, or we wouldn't see in that period where, where the uh, decay tanks were off scale right around uh, this, the, uh, shortly after that period, and I'm forgetting the date right now. So anyway, as far as any definitive statements that say, I can't really disprove those conjectures, or rather, I can't really disprove those conjectures based upon the measurements, and I suspect that we never will be able to. The people that, that really could have answered the question just aren't around, or like me, their memory isn't that good and they wouldn't be able to tell us anyway. Okay, now, 
one other thing. I want to talk a little bit about projected health effects because uh, I think that uh, one of the things that Dr. Bea in his report talks about are potentially large numbers of latent cancer fatalities in the population, and he estimates something on the order of uh, potentially 250 for these large releases. It all is tied to these large releases of iodine and cesium. And, and the way that analysis was done is very controversial. And it relates to something we call the, the linear no threshold approximation in which uh, we uh, can use some uh, conversion factors that are based upon data that was involved, people that received very large radiation doses, and extrapolate that to, to doses that are just a small fraction or equivalent to our, our normal background radiation. And, and, uh, and I'm not going to get into the debate there. There are strong arguments on both sides as to the value of, of using these data, whether they're very conservative or whether they're, even whether they're not conservative. It is certainly true, however, though, that in that analysis, it's not a matter in Dr. Bea's calculations that there were people in the neighborhood of the plant that received uh, significant doses and they had a fairly significantly high potential to get cancer and that's what this constitutes, this 250 people. It really comes from extremely small doses in his analysis to very large populations of people. And, and so among this 8 million people exposed, people with very small doses, um, th that's where really, you really get these fairly large potential numbers of latent cancer fatalities. Well, when I looked at the doses I'm sorry, the releases that Lockbaum was talking about of, with 30% of cesium and iodine, and from my experience with commercial reactors, I realized even though I don't think that, there were, that, they were, that those are real, they really aren't that dramatically large releases. And so I did a calculation with a dispersion model using the 30% release of cesium and iodine and, and fairly realistic um, meteorology, but but very conservative with regards to it. It assumes that all of these releases occur basically instantaneously, that the person that's exposed, this maximally exposed individual that's breathing this in and, and receiving a dose from the passing cloud, that the wind doesn't shift during this time period. And in reality, these releases that are the controlled releases occurred over a period of two months. Um, and the releases, and, and if there were releases that are being bypassed somehow, uh, during the time period of the accident, they were over a period of time when the wind could have shifted, when the guy could have gone off to work, and this maximally exposed individual could have gone inside his house rather than standing out there breathing it all in. Anyway, um, and, and I calculate a value less than 5 rem for that maximally exposed individual. Well, what does that mean? Um, well, at 5 rem, using the conversion factors that they used, you would estimate that the additional risk of cancer is three parts out of a thousand. That is, your cancer risk would, as a result of that event, if you got five rem, would be three parts out of a thousand. And then that would add on to whatever your background risk is, which is on the order of 25%, something like that. It, those same numbers, that, that also means that your increase would be about a percent, one percent. That is, your increase would be increased by about that much. So, so that's the worst condition that I can think of as far as people that were in the vicinity of the plant. And, and I don't believe that. And I think that, that even that number is extremely conservative relative if you started to get into the games as well, um, what was the wind doing and how was it shifting and, and people moving around and stuff like that, versus the fact that, that I think that Dr. Cochran's numbers, his maximum bounds wouldn't be close to 30%. They would be uh, bounded by, um, by smaller numbers than that. So, so I, um, in this sense, I'm, I fully agree. I mean, it, now, this doesn't relate to anything else that happened at the site. I didn't look at anything else that happened at this site, other, either radiologically or chemically. But as far as this particular event here is concerned, 
even if you believe the lock bombs numbers, and even if you believe the use of these conversion factors that Dr. Bay used, I think that you conclude that to the people in the vicinity of this plant, this one event was not a significant event as far as affecting uh, the probability of cancer. Thank you.